Hi, I'm Erin Power. And I'm Laura Rupsis. We're certified health coaches, and this is Health Coach Radio. This podcast is about the art, science, and business of health coaching. We share our insider tips to help you become a better coach and entrepreneur. And we interview expert guests to discover how they've made it in this growing field. It's time for health coaches to make an impact. It's time for Health Coach Radio. Today's guest is Dr. Rick Henriksen, the medical director of Steady MD, a medical concierge service that deconstructs doctors' visits and healthcare from inside the walls of brick and mortar clinics and puts it out into the exciting telemedicine space. Steady MD partners patients with the perfect doctor based on medical needs, personal interests, goals, and more. Then, patient and doctor have their comprehensive first appointment via two-way video chat where they really get to know each other and together develop a plan to monitor and manage the patient's health. From then on, it's a real relationship with the doctor available anytime via phone, text, or video chat. Amazing stuff. Dr. Rick Henriksen is a board-certified family physician. As a treating physician, he draws upon principles of ancestral health, Western integrative and functional medicine to improve the long-term health and whole body wellness of his patients. While he's been an advocate of healthcare and tech integration, he's also painfully aware of growing patient concerns stemming from today's more impersonal and costly healthcare experiences. This is why SteadyMD was the perfect fit for him as a practicing physician. We'd love to have you screenshot your podcast player and tag us on Instagram at Health Coach Radio. By the way, the show notes for this episode and all previous episodes of Health Coach Radio can always be found at primalhealthcoach.com slash radio. Our show is proudly brought to you by Primal Health Coach Institute, now an accredited educational provider with the National Board of Health and Wellness Coaches. This means that our graduates can become eligible to sit for the NBHWC credentialing exam to become a board-certified health and wellness coach. Check out primalhealthcoach.com slash level two to learn about our new advanced coaching certification taught by me that will nudge you out of your comfort zone, launch you into coaching mastery, and qualify you to sit for the board exam. My co-host Laura will share a little more about what we teach and how at the end of today's episode. In the meantime, let's get on with the show and welcome Steady MD's Dr. Rick Henriksen. All right, welcome Dr. Rick Henriksen. It's wicked to have you here with us today. We're looking forward to chatting uh, all things Steady MD, telehealth, everything that you can teach us. But before Absolutely. we do that, I'm happy to be here. Okay, good. Well, before we do that, I think uh, we'd love to have your origin stories, just so anybody listening can get the, the gist of who you are, what you do, kind of the three to five minute speaker bio to help us get up to speed with you. Oh, man. Okay, so three to five minutes of my of my history here. So I have come through a really interesting road, I think, um, to where I am now and to where I thought my dreams and aspirations were are very different than they were before. So I, I'm, I went to medical school in New York City. I grew up, I grew up in Utah, Salt Lake, went to New York, the big city for medical school, um, realized I wanted to be a family doctor and take care of um, individuals and families. I really loved the, the life, the full lifespan of taking care of patients. And so then I, I finished my, my medical degree, came back to Utah, um, to my mountains and family and did my residency in family medicine. Um, during residency, I realized that I actually wasn't walking the walk that I was telling people all about. I was not exercising, wasn't eating healthy. And I made some really big changes, which I, we can go into later, but made some personal big changes in my life that led me to um, triathlon and CrossFit and the ancestor health paleo world. Um, and started slowly modifying my practice. So I, I, after I finished residency, I stayed on as a faculty member at the University of Utah. I taught residents, I taught um, medical students. Um, and, and I was slowly trying to introduce a lot of my kind of primal paleo background. And it was very difficult. It was difficult with the short visits that I had. It was difficult in, in the large organization to really bring my ideas of what I, of how I wanted to deliver medicine. And, um, I was also uh, did a lot of teaching to, to medical students about uh, new ways of delivering healthcare. Um, I have a background also in health policy, and so part of what I did is I taught students like different ways of delivering care. And so I was really stuck in this interesting place where I was I was in this model 
um, that was very traditional 15 minute, 20 minute visits, teaching my medical students about these like revolutionary ways of delivering care and not doing it. And then also knowing the background of, of what I did in, in primal and paleo um, and new on those ideas and trying to slowly in introduce those ideas with my patients, but not really having a great um, atmosphere for that. So um, three years ago, I decided I was done with that world. I, I quit my uh, position, resigned, and then started up um, my own clinic and there, um, thereafter, shortly other thereafter, started SteadyMD. So I like kind of went through this um, very interesting evolution of, of combining both this kind of telehealth, new, new style of delivering care with my background in, in primal ancestral health. When was that? When was, uh, when did you launch into telehealth? When I, and I launched into telehealth, um, three years ago. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I've been doing it for about three years and, and, and really a hybrid system of starting three years ago. Um, two years ago is when I, I started fully going online with some of my patients. So I'd never seen some of my patients in person at all. So right. Even now I see some of my patients in person, some through telemedicine and then a hybrid with a lot of my patients as well. So um, yeah, definitely in this kind of first wave of, of telehealth, I remember being on as a faculty member at the university and saying, hey, we should do telemedicine. And it was this kind of really novel idea. They're like, oh no, we can't get that to work. And it was very frustrating for me, which then prompted me to kind of step outside of that and do it on my own. So I want to know why they, why they thought it couldn't work. What were the proposed barriers to it? You know, I don't, I don't think it was because it couldn't work. It's just such a big organization. It was just slowly, you know, it, mm -hmm. took, it took time to get it to work. And now obviously coronavirus really jump-started everything. So may, pretty much every organization now is able to provide some telehealth in some way, um, but they're really behind and they're, and they're, pro they're providing that, that um, those visits in a really disjointed way. Um, it doesn't really seem seamless. And, and so there are a lot of organizations that, that are now coming on, but you know, it's a big organization. It's hard to do. It's hard to change. It's hard to interrupt their, their really set schedule. And especially in an insurance model, it's very difficult to do what I want to do through telemedicine because the billing codes don't line up. The timing doesn't line up and, and patients insurances are really not willing to, to pay for what, what I'm fully able to offer. And so um, kind of a lot of those combined, it's just, it's very difficult in a large organization like that. Yeah. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah, no, that makes total sense. Um, you know, part of the reason I reached out to you to have you on is because I am a patient at SteadyMD, and so is my husband. And I was astonished at how effective it is doing it remotely. And I could not help but see the parallel to just telecare in general, right? And that the vast majority, well, I, I guess I can't say the vast majority, but my notion is the vast majority of health coaches are doing a lot of their work remotely For sure. um, and could really learn from you and your experience and what you guys are able to do at SteadyMD and really kind of um, think through how not only they can continue to broaden and, 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 and the breadth of their practice through sort of remote care, but then also partner with allied, you know, you know, professionals that are in this realm, because there's a lot that health coaches can't do legally from a licensure perspective, and they need the help and the support of an MD and a doctor and somebody who's licensed. And I think it would be helpful to, you know, to work with somebody that understands how that care works. I mean, absolutely. For me, it's like the best, I mean, the best scenario is this team, is this team-based care, right? So I have a, have a patient and me as the provider able to deliver care, but it's so nice to have somebody else that is, is, helping to day to day do that health coaching motivation, right? All of those really important pieces that I can't necessarily do full time for each of my patients, right? So it's really wonderful to have that team approach. And, and you're right through that telemedicine, we're able to, to reach a lot of patients that we just, we weren't able to reach before. And my, you know, if I have a, my clinic here in Salt Lake City, like I'm, I'm, you know, I can see a couple hundred thousand, like that's maybe the like, the like footprint that I have. My geography is, you know, people are willing to be willing to drive a couple hours to see me, but through telemedicine and through steady ND, I'm, you know, I'm able to see people in rural Texas, rural, rural Georgia, right. That, or Arkansas, like I have patients that are focused in, in a primal ancestor health, um, way, or, or even, you know, or even they just like mountain biking. They can't find a, a doctor who likes mountain biking, whatever it is, that alignment <laughs> really is like so critical. 
But like if they're in the middle of nowhere, like it's so hard to find them. So it's really nice to be able to deliver that care to people that really want it. And that alignment is just so fun um, in, in that process. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh my gosh. Absolutely. How many times has a patient felt like completely misaligned with their doctor? Like, why is this old man telling me to like, I don't, you know, <laughs> I just, yeah, I mean, exa- exactly. Like I, I was in a training session once with Kelly Starrett, um, and learning about, you know, movement and all this stuff. And he, and he was taught, we were talking and he was like, you know, the, the first question you need to ask your doctor before you even like say anything is you have to ask him like, what's your deadlift, right? So if they're not <laughs> able to answer, <laughs> And so like, what is your, like, whatever your particular field or your interest is, you like, you got to find that the the question that you can ask them. Like if you, if you're into macros or whatever you like, and you say, Hey doc, what what are your current macros? And they can't answer you or at least understand what you're saying. I'm like, just get up and walk out. Like don't even stay in there because it's not worth it. And so that alignment is critical. It is. It is. But I think, I think this is like, it's hilarious to imagine like, what question would you ask your doctor to (laughs) find out if you're, but, but at the same time, don't you find that generally culturally, the patient's been kind of disempowered. Like, oh, I just show up and uh, this is the doctor I've been given. And I sit there quietly with my hands folded and, and oh, oh yeah, okay, yeah. You know what I mean? Like- Absolutely, yeah. I mean, very empowered. I mean, it's a very, very disempowered position. And especially like in insurance, people ask me all the time, like, what doctor should I go see? And I'm like, first question, I'm like, well, what insurance do you have? Like, it's so restrictive. And then I try to give them a few ideas and like, oh, they're not taking patients and this. I'm like, and it's so you walk in and I mean, I feel the same way when I'm like, try, I'm like, I need to go in for something. And I'm like, I, I'm, I don't know this person. You try and things are better now because you can read more reviews and, and, but it's still, it's very difficult to get an idea of who that person is. Mm-hmm. And it's such a time investment, right? So you're going in, you're taking time off work. Um, if you're doing a kind of traditional in-person model, like you have to leave work, you have to go there. You have to find a, potentially find a babysitter or whatever it is. You go in and like you have like a 10 minute visit, you wait in a waiting room. It's like, it's just like so inefficient and so frustrating. And then to sit there in front of somebody who like doesn't even get you, mm-hmm. um, can be very, very frustrating uh, for patients. Oh yeah. I mean, so my, my first experience, um, you know, I, I filled out a whole questionnaire and somebody, somebody literally personally paired me with Dr. Danny because they knew I owned a CrossFit affiliate and Dr. Danny was a CrossFit guy, you know, yeah. And when I wanted to get my husband set up, the reason we needed to get him in was because of his anxiety. Uh, we had moved, it's a long story, but um, we needed to get him back on his meds. He keeps trying to go off them. And every time he goes off, he's fine for a couple of months and then something happens and it's just a, a, it's just a big mess. So we needed to get him back on, but he needed, um, so anyway, this was part of what, you know, hey, why are you coming here? Well, this is why I'm coming here. And the doctor he was paired with is somebody who's actually dealt with anxiety himself. And, yeah. and so we did get him on a medication, but you know what else he prescribed him? Meditation. Oh, meditation, sleep. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, so he, you know, we were able to say, this is kind of how we live. This is what we believe in. We have an ancestral model and this is what I'm struggling with. And they were able to find him a doctor that, I mean, I, I was blown away. You know, and I personally work with clients and I know Aaron does too, who their stuff, whatever it is they're struggling with, you know, perhaps it's, um, you know, uh, Aaron works in the metabolism space and, you know, you have a lot of folks that were weight loss is an issue, but it's, we're also dealing with blood sugar dysregulation and a lot of things. And, um, you know, but I, I have worked with clients too, whose doctors have literally told them that diet doesn't really matter. Oh, it's not going to make a big difference. It's not worth trying. Like, yeah, very. Exactly. You know. That they cannot turn their type two diabetes around, that they will always be on medication. Doctors are telling them this and we fundamentally know it's not true, but I'm not allowed to say it. Right. So I have to find a doctor who can help my client feel more empowered. Right. right. That can say, yes, you've got the power to do this and, and, and work. So, I mean, I just think this is such a phenomenal tool. And the reason I wanted to have you on is so everybody could hear about it. Not yeah, that absolutely. everybody's listening to my <laughs> podcast, but so, you know, through your clinic and through Steady MD, how do clients find you? Like what's the mechanism there as far as being findable and helping patients? Yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, I, advertising, obviously we Steady MD uses influencers, podcasting. We, we've done that. That is, that is a big um, component for us. So we, we're, we're, we're using 
people that have platforms um, in in spaces that we believe in, right? So mm-hmm. through CrossFit or triathlon running of uh, different areas. And so we have positions that are then personally in, in interested in certain different areas also. And so they, so we try to find a variety of different avenues to, to capture patients that would be interested. Um, you know, as you know, it's not, it's not an easy process of finding somebody and finding mm-hmm. that alignment, but, but what's someone, what someone is saying, okay, they've seen the study in the ad, or they, they've heard a listen to podcasts, they go to the website, um, and there's a little button at the top that says, get started. You click on that button. It immediately takes you to a quiz. Um, and this, this quiz, you don't get graded on it, but what it does is, is sh- tries to bring out your alignment. Mm-hmm. Um, so it talks about like, are you a mom? Are you a dad? Do you have no kids? Do you, what do you find important? Do you want functional medicine, integrative medicine, or more, tr- you know, more, Western medicine? Do you, do you like mountain biking? Do you like running and weightlifting? So whatever it is you do, you, you're clicking on all these buttons. And then our marketing team has put together this really great algorithm that then tries to then match you with a doctor that has availability in your and licensed in your state, right? So all of these kind of big mm-hmm. picture items, and then also is aligned with what you're interested in. So then you get a, a list of three doctors that then you can go research more and, and look at. Now, if none of those three work, then you can always reach out to the kind of membership team and say, Hey, you know, like, I'm interested in someone. I live in New Mexico. Who, who are my options or, or, or whatever that, that may be. And so we, we try to do our best and there's no doubt that the better the alignment is, the, the better kind of long-term uh, commitment is better that, that um, retention rate for the patient and the doctor, like they just enjoy working with each other better. So, so that's a big component of what we do um, as, as far as, and I think that's, relatively unique in, in kind of this, in this world where, where you, you don't have that opportunity in other, in other places. So, um, you know, it doesn't always work. It doesn't always match the alignment. And sometimes we have to kind of figure out, okay, that, you know, this actually isn't a good fit and we'll, we'll figure that out later. I've recently started doing discovery calls, um, with my patients just to make sure that like, yeah, this is really going to be, um, a good fit because that, that people are committing, um, to at least a year mm-hmm. and, and, and going through a plan. Cause I think it takes at least that long really to, to get a lot of movement. And so we do want to make sure that, that you, that the patients are lined up with the right person um, in their venue. And it's not for everyone, right? So if you, if, if the clients or your patients in our, in our case are not tech tech savvy enough, they can't do the app or they have trouble with zoom, like, you know, maybe it's not the right place for you to try to work it out. But sometimes it just isn't a good fit. And so we do want to make sure that, that, patients are happy because then we have happy doctors and everyone gets better if we, if, if you're that way. So, um, that was a really long winded answer for how you get aligned um, with your doctor. Yeah. That's, that's how we try to do it. No, oh, I love it. it. It works great. And you know, just from my experience, I pay like a monthly fee, but I don't pay for doctor visits or anything. I'm paying a monthly fee and if, you know, and you know, I, I booked some time with Dr. Danny cause I'm a dork and I wanted a glucose, a continuous glucose monitor. And I wanted to kind of sort of dial in some nutrition and, you know, we chatted about it and I wore it for a couple of weeks and I found some stuff that really surprised me. Yeah. I booked some more time with him and say, should I be concerned about the fact that my blood sugar fell to 50 overnight? You know, did you, were you symptomatic? Blah, 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 blah. This is the way you're eating. He knows, right? That I eat a lower carbohydrate diet. I do a lot of, he's like, you know what? I think you just need to eat more and maybe you can add a few more carbs, but I wouldn't be worried about it. Right. But, and I could do that. And it was, it was super easy. So I just think the flexibility is phenomenal. Now you have more of a hybrid model. You're not strictly a hundred percent of your clients aren't steady MD clients. You also have a clinic. So there's a parallel here to uh, health coaches, right. Who may have kind of a hybrid model in their practice, or perhaps they have something else they're doing entirely professionally, um, full-time and then looking to do something like this part-time. So was that a conscious choice for you? You wanted to be able to do both and how's it working? Yeah. I mean, I think, oh gosh, that's such a loaded question. Um, (laughs) yeah, I mean, I think it's so, I think most, most, I mean, in our, in our current, you know, modern, economic lifestyle right most people are working multiple jobs and something on the side and and for me i i have blended um steady and and then my own clinic that's based in Salt like really on a, almost a 50 50 type of framework and so i spend about half my time in each and it's actually worked really well i treat my patients the same whether they're they're here in person or steady md um i do have to learn two different sets of software and i but, but in my own, you know, in my own clinic, and this is the parallel probably with your health coaches, like 
in my own thing, I get to like make all the decisions. And it's really, it's really fun to like make all the decisions. But then in the bigger group of setting, yeah, I get to work with a team and there's other people that I interact with and people that I learn from. And, and so there's this really wonderful environment of like learning from each other. And we do, you know, we will, we'll do like patient cases. And so I miss that in my own clinic. If I was just in my own clinic, I would, I wouldn't have any of that interaction. I'd just be sitting in my desk or, you know, or going to patients' houses or whatever it is, like all day long by myself. And that's like kind of an isolated um, experience. So for me, I really like the, the blend. Um, and I think it works the stability of having the, 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 the contract with, with a larger organization. Um, so yeah, so I, I, for me, it works really well. I think um, some people don't like getting pulled in multiple directions. So the, the, you know, the down thing is like, you know, mm-hmm. learning multiple um, EMR or, or medical records uh, or, you know, just having, you know, it's, it's like having, I still have kind of the boss, right? Somebody that, that I have to account to that's not me in, in half of my world. And so um, there's definitely are some drawbacks, but I think overall, I, I really prefer it. Um, and, well, you know, it's, it, but things change, right? So you never know like what's going to happen with, with your, or maybe I'll, you know, close my private clinic and go all steady into your, you know, it, and I think keeping open to that idea is really important, especially, you know, in your case with, with your health coaches is that the, the landscape is changing so quickly. Um, you know, five years ago, I would never have looked to like hire a health coach. And right now, you know, in my local clinic, you know, I have a, um, I have a hybrid, um, sub, you know, mid-level, she's a, she's a physician assistant, but also a health coach. And so, you know, I've had that person on my staff. She sees my patients here locally, you know, and it's a real, like five years ago, that never would have, I never would have looked for like someone that also was a health coach. And so, mm-hmm. um, with that changing landscape, I think you're going to be seeing a lot more larger organizations doing that, but you also have the ability of having your own practice, which is really, really fun. So it's such an interesting landscape, an interesting place to be where you have all those options available. Um, and, and you don't want to limit yourself, but you also don't want to like, spread yourself too thin. Yeah. Do you know what I think is really exciting about that? This changing landscape is that, I mean, from, from the perspective of a health coach, it's, this is new, like we're, we're new here, you know, this is sort of fledgling, but the medical, um, machine or industry or whatever we're going to call it. I feel like we talked about this maybe with somebody a long time ago, maybe Dr. William Davis seems like the kind of guy who would have mentioned this, but it's old. <laughs> like it's an old paradigm, right? And, and the way it's always been done, it, this is the way it's always been done. And it's like it needed to be modernized or just refreshed or something. So it's really cool. Like, like a physician can sort of can sort of take their entrepreneurial spirit by the horns and do fun stuff that actually lights them up rather than being stuck in that old medical system paradigm. So I think it's really exciting that, you know, the changing landscape that you kind of articulated, even for doctors, like for, for health coaches, we're new, but even, even doctors can kind of start shaking things up a little bit and doing what really lights them up, which I think is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. It, it is good. And you, you also have to be a little bit careful because sometimes your patients or clients are not ready to go forward with That's you right. either. So yeah. one of the issues that I faced is like when I started my clinic, I had like all these big ideas and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And, and, and I, like I, my, the first like six months that I had my clinic open, like I had a per, like I, I had a free workout for my patients, like every week they could like, and I had like a Pilates studio and then I had a CrossFit gym and then we were going for a hike and like, like nobody wow. came. It was like, it was like, this is so cool. And like, and so I had all these like ideas and I'm like, maybe it wasn't the timing wasn't right. Or, but like, it's, it came to find out like people had their own thing and they're okay. They didn't need me to provide that. And so then I modified to what my patients actually needed and wanted. But I, but I think that's, what's fun is like in this landscape, you have to like come up with some of those ideas and like try them out. I'm like, is this going to work? And because you're a small organization, you're nimble enough that you can try that mm-hmm. without investing a million dollars or whatever it is. Um, but, but yeah, it is so fun to be able to, to be able to, to try some of those ideas. And if they fail, huh, that's all right. That's right. No, that's, that, that's a good point though. Like the health consumer is, is trapped in that old school paradigm too. And it's going to probably take a few, maybe generations even before the health consumer, uh, can appreciate that a doctor offering to take you outside on a hike is actually part of a healthcare plan, you know, because right. I, and I think that's honestly, unfortunately, one of the criticisms that the medical machine gets it's like, Oh, it's the sick care system. Doctors know how to take care of illness. They don't know how to take care of health, but like a doctor like yourself is like, let's go and lift some weights. Let's go for a hike. And you're 
you're delivering health behaviors to the client, patient, sorry, but the patient's not used to hearing that from a doctor. Right. Yeah. But that's almost like, that's a, that's a paradigm that's going to probably take a lot, like a big, slow boat that's going to need to turn quite slowly. But I, I mean, maybe slowly, but I don't know. I mean, like, it, I do think that, um, I think it'll be faster than they think, to be honest. <laughs> I, I really, but it, it's going to take some time, but like faster than, you know, centuries. You know, I don't know. We'll see, but... Um, I think you're right. Yeah. I think we're, I think there's an appetite for it. Uh, I think we, we've talked about this on our podcast before, but the, this COVID-19 has been horrible. However, there have been some things that I think are a positive, one of which is more of a focus on wellness and prevention. Um, I mean, I've, I've had more friends and family reach out and actually have an interest in just being healthier in general. And they just don't know how to do it. Um, so yeah, I, I, mean, think- I, I was going to say, I've, I've, I've seen that as well. I think, um, I, I feel like there's almost like a dichotomy happening to you where you have some people going that direction and some people like I'm going the opposite and like, I don't care. I'm be unhealthy. Right. You're seeing, you're seeing both of those groups. And mm-hmm. so maybe like the slow boat turning for like the people that were like, not interested that's Mm -hmm. gonna take a long time for them but you know like i've come also to the place where i don't talk i don't try to talk people into it anymore i like my job is like i'm not selling you on my primal like that's not what i I don't need to do that like i've tried that i've tried to talk people into doing it it never works if they're interested i'm available and i will help you i will do anything i can to help you like I'm done talking people into it. Like if they, when they're ready, they'll come to me and I'll help them out. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Thank you for saying that because it is so true. And I, I know Aaron's in this boat. I know I, I, I do not try to argue with people anymore. I don't try to convince anybody of anything. I have never actually sold my program. I have a conversation with people and I offer to help. If they want help, fantastic. They will come to you. Um, and I, I definitely think we're seeing a whole new wave. I was having a conversation with my, um, stepmom about how, you know, what, where we, we need to get people to the point where they're just not fearful anymore. We're kind of back to this COVID thing. And the only way we're going to get people feel for, uh, get people away from being fearful is so that they feel stronger. They feel they've got nothing to fear. And the only way they've got nothing to fear is if they feel healthier, right? They feel bulletproof or whatever the case may be. And, um, we are seeing more and more physicians go that way. Aaron and I went to the metabolic health summit the last two years in, um, in California and tons and tons of doctors, tons and tons of doctors and RDs and licensed clinical practitioners that want to learn how to, they want to learn about lifestyle medicine. They want to learn about how food impacts that stuff. I mean, that particular conference is really all about keto, but at the end of the day, the takeaway is just how powerful food and lifestyle really are towards not only overall wellness, but actually treating disease. And this is where health coaches and MDs or anyone who's licensed can work together to get them there. Right. Right. That's what's going to bring those. I think that, um, right now don't seem interested is when the conventional paradigm kind of slowly starts to make this shift folks, guys like my dad, you know, who are, I mean, he's in his seventies now, if he can fix it with a pill, he'd almost rather do that, but he's starting to shift now. He's like, I'm going to the gym. And so he's, he's scared. It, it takes, it takes a while, but it, it, from, you, ha- you do have to look back and say like it was 10 years ago, you know, I was a resident. I had been doing kind of this lifestyle for a while. Um, and I had to do a grand round. A grand round means like a big talk in front of all of your peers to your department. And so I, I decided I wanted to do it on, on paleo and ancestral health and evolutionary medicine. Like I, and I walked in and I was like, it was like the first time that anybody had ever heard like, you know, carbohydrates aren't the thing, you know? And so it was like this real, like, I, it was like, oh, that was 10 years ago, but like now, like, I, you don't, I would, that talk would be like, why would you ever give that talk? Like people already know all of that stuff. And so it's really fun to be, to have seen where things are now and then think like, well, 10 years, from, 10 years from now, how more ubiquitous is it going to be in the population? And 
people are not going to, you know, even, you know, people are, are not afraid of fat. In my, in my sphere of reference, people are not afraid of fat anymore. Mm -hmm. It's it, for the most part, right? So some, it's still there, but, but it's at least they have like heard like, oh, I've, I've heard that butter isn't bad for me anymore. Like I don't have to start that conversation anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that's a good point. I, I was commenting on that the last time we were at Paleo Effects. It's like, like that would have been two years ago because it didn't happen right. this year. Um, it's like, man, this is mainstream now. This is so yeah. mainstream now. There's nothing even there's nothing even novel about the ancestral health approach at this point. But but to kind of go back to Laura's comment about the Metabolic Health Summit, that that conference is is only full at this point of um, doctors and you know health practitioners, coaches, it's not, the consumer's not really there yet. Mm -hmm. It's like the consumer hasn't fully got on board with some of these like advanced metabolic paradigms that can really move the needle on health. Um, but you know, 10 years from now, that could be a very different thing. Um, you know, because you are in the ancestral health space and just for anybody listening, all three of us on this podcast are in the ancestral health space. Right. That's not always the case, but for today it is. So just bear with us as we kind of geek out on this. <laughs> um, yeah, you're right. Like people don't think fat is bad anymore. Thankfully, we got over that. You know, the, the saturated fat isn't bad for you. The I think it was the AMA really quietly leaked that. Didn't right. put a lot of fanfare behind it. They're like, oops, yeah, that's not bad after all. But I want to hear from you. Are you still getting people who are being told that plants are better that but we should be eating more plants because this is something that i've seen in my practice snowball like but i'm supposed to be eating more plants you know we're supposed to be moving to a plant-based thing because of you know ethics and environment and health um just i'm just curious if you're seeing that and one of the reasons i'm asking is because i just watched david attenborough's uh freaking documentary on netflix did you guys watch that beautiful which one Doc david attenborough who's the nature documentary guy like 93 year old man put out a Netflix documentary about planet earth, which as you can imagine, is super depressing because we're exploiting this planet. <laughs> and then at the end, it's like, so what's the solution? And I'm like, oh no, oh no, don't say it. Don't say it. Please don't say it. The solution is to eat more plants. And it's like, no, it's like, dang it. This, this soundbite. And I, again, apologies to anybody listening to this podcast who was plant-based coach, but I want to hear just from you because we're in this ancestral health echo chamber right now. Um, are you finding that messaging coming in a lot more from your patients and how are you managing it? Um, so I, I'm in a little bit of an isolated, a little bit of a unique position because I do, I have like pretty good barriers of like screening out some of some folks that even would even approach me. Um, so I don't, I do have quite a few vegan patients and vegetarian patients that we work through kind of how to do that in the best way possible. Cause I have a lot of background in that area as well. I do. I mean, I think that there's certainly a big push obviously towards veganism and vegetarian, especially like for the environmental factors in those areas, which can be argued till the, you know, till the cows come home. Right. <laughs> and, um, and, and there's a documentary coming out every week. That's, that's for like veganism that like I watch and I'm like that, like the, none of the things you're saying actually are based in science or make sense, but like, it's really hard to, to, to teach that in a way without like in this argument, right? This like the religion of nutrition is like so strong. Um, and so it's, it's, it is tough. So there are, there are more people coming. I don't think, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's not like the plants are good. It's more like I need to stop eating as much meat because I'm going right. to like right, the yeah. moral thing or whatever it is. And so, but I don't know if, I think that's definitely stronger. I don't, um, and there's definitely more of a push to that. Um, but I do think that there is a, like the counter push from a greater, but also an increasing number of people that are, that are pushing for like, well, there, there's, you know, actually like a well-raised animal and, you know, in an integrative approach is going to be better for our environment than, than mono cropping, right? So, mm -hmm. um, so there, I think there is kind of that counter push, but it's not, it's definitely not as strong. And I think it's definitely still over, overbalance, you know, WHO and, and other organizations. And so um, that's still ongoing. Um, but yeah, I think it is frustrating to, to see that. But I also feel like, like we said earlier, like if they, people are, people are approaching um, and they want to learn from me and, and I'm happy to kind of talk about my philosophies and, and go that route. Um, but yeah, I, I do have to have, so, so that was a really, really long segue, but like, I do have to have this conversation a lot with people that like, I'm, I have to say like, 
for you, plants are not okay right now. Like mm -hmm. it is, we just have to like come up and say this, like you have a medical condition and broccoli is not good for that. Okay. And so they're like, well, broccoli is, I've always been told right. broccoli is okay. But like, no, you as a specific person, like your gut cannot handle broccoli. You don't absorb the, the nutrients from it. You're not absorbing it. And it's causing issues. Like you're causing gut problems from the plants because that's right. what's happening. And so, so that, that conversation is like, oh, that's kind of eye opening for a lot of people mm -hmm. when they, when they realize that. I'll bet. I'm still hearing mostly like red meat, you know, and I'm trying to think of who I was talking to, but I, I heard it twice from two different people that they're, they were told they have to limit red meat and then salt. And I'm like, oh, here we go. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's honestly the reason why I went down that totally weird rabbit hole because, because like Laura, I'm hearing this more lately. It's like, oh, I thought, I thought we were changing our minds on that, but it's like the pendulum swinging back. I don't know. You know, I'm wondering if, you know, folks in the sort of plant-based or vegan community are realizing arguing against meat period, all animal foods is tougher. And if they pick on one thing in particular, red meat is the easiest for whatever reason. And I'm, I'm trying to pinpoint why um, red meat in particular, you know, um, because there's a lot we know about all sorts of different animals. Um, I, I'm just not getting it, but I, and we had a conversation with Diana Rogers who kind of talked about this a little bit yeah. um, with us, but that's what I'm hearing. And the, the other thing I'm still hearing a lot of is having to cut back on salt. And again, me as a health coach, I can provide them with resources. Yeah. I can tell them, you know what, hey, take a look at this article, but this is a case where I would need another doctor to explain the mechanism there and that in their instance, that might not necessarily be true. And that perhaps it's sugar <laughs> or some of these polyunsaturated fats that are really the problem. I mean, I had this conversation yesterday with someone who was um, going, she, she transitioned to a much lower carbohydrate diet than she had been doing before, right? So she's only doing like, she's doing 80, under 80 grams of carbs which for her is really low. And then she's mm -hmm. doing 50 some days. And, but then, you know, we had this whole conversation and she's doing great. She's added more protein and she's, she's feeling a lot better and all of her symptoms are getting better. But, but then, you know, at the very end, she's like, well, what about all the salt? You, you're telling me to like, take this like electrolyte too. And, and so having a conversation about, about how important that is in the way that she's eating. And, and so it is nice that I do have some, you know, I have, I, for whatever reason, that cultural, um, ability of saying like, Oh, and they're like, okay, I'll do it because my doctor said so. And like, for me, that's like, you know, that's a privilege. I'm like privileged in a lot of different ways. And that is one of them is that I do have that, that standing to be able to do that. Um, and that is nice, but I do, it's the salt thing is really interesting as a medical student 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago, we like, we read articles that were saying salt isn't as bad as people said it was like, that was 20 years ago. And like, we're still having this conversation and, you know, there's some people that are like heavy salt responders. And if we remove some salt from their diet, their, their blood pressures do decrease, but like the majority of the population is not bad. And, and, and so it's really, it's just an interesting, um, it's an interesting topic that I've seen since the beginning of my career in medicine that has still stuck around. And, and as a provider who has seen people be on, like trying to do low salt to like help their blood pressure, it's like, I just have not seen it in a clinical way to be helpful. Like, I just don't like, I just have not seen it. So it's really, it's really fun, but it's, yeah, it's an interesting, it's an interesting holdover from old research. Well, it's a good example of kind of what you mentioned is like the nuance and the, the biochemically unique snowflakeness of every patient that comes into you come to see you. So if you do have a salt uh, hyper responder, um, you would pivot and, and approach that particular patient with what they need rather than mm -hmm. just sort of applying dogma, which I think is um, another interesting part of the changing landscape. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, another example of that is, you know, let's not be afraid of fat, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean you should be adding butter to your coffee if you're looking to lose weight or some other things. And then also there are some folks who, you know, from a... Um, how they process lipids, a whole lot of saturated fat might not work well for them. You know, they might need to add a few more olives <laughs> and some olive oil and maybe cut back on a whole lot of cheese, you know, um, and other things. But this is, there's other people that, that handle it all just fine. Um, and we keep seeing these like 
blanket recommendations broadly that, and then you wonder why two thirds of the population is unwell because these guidelines are built for the average person, right? The average American or what have you. Well, guess what? There's like one dude who's average and then everybody else is gonna fall along the bell curve somewhere. And so you lose so much of this. Um, yeah, and I, I, you, oh, go ahead, sorry. I was gonna say, this is why I just think it's so important for doctors to be, to be taught nutrition and to take that bull by the horns, whether it's they handle it or they bring in a coach like you've done to, um, to, to use this because it's, it's so powerful, but it's so highly nuanced. And this, I mean, and you hear, I'm sure you see it in medicine, doctors that, um, not doctors, but patients that work well with a particular medication and others that don't tolerate it at all. Right. Absolutely. It's, um, I have to have this conversation all with my patients where I just have to say, it's not fair. Mm -hmm. I wish that you could eat the same thing as your wife or your husband or whatever. Like I, it's not fair. Like you can't eat that. Like, Oh, I really want to have some of that. I'm like, I know you really want to, but like, it's not fair. And you can't do that right now. Maybe you can in the future, but like, at least for you right now, like a, it's, it's just, it's not going to be helpful for you. Um, but I, and I, it's, it's a, it's a hard conversation to hear, mm -hmm. but at the same time, I think, um, having that and then having it reinforced with other people and, and seeing results is, is the benefit, right? So I can tell people, you know, even though, even that I have long visits, I have access to me through the chat app, you know, I can tell people and I can give them those principles of like, okay, this is what I need you to do. And some people can do that, right? Like I say, like, I, I tell people like, I, what I want you to do is just, I just want you to eat meat and vegetables. That's what I don't want you to eat. And they're like, oh, I can do that. And then they go eat meat and vegetables and they're fine. Other people are like, what? Like, how do I even know how to do that? Like, what, how would I ever eat meat and vegetables? And, and so then I'm like, I need a health coach to like clearly teach you how, like, how do you not like, it's so interesting. Some people is their background and what they need. Um, they're like, I can't, I don't know. How, what do I eat for breakfast? Like, how could I eat breakfast? Like what? I, I'm, I'm like, I, lose some little imagination. Anyway. So, um, so it is fun to pair up with people that can help do that part of it. And I can like, okay, they need a health coach to help them out with that because I don't have the time to teach them how to cook an egg. Oh. Um, so. <laughs> or what to eat instead of eggs. I'm sick of eggs. What can I have for breakfast? Literally anything. <laughs> yeah, anything you, whatever. I mean, and then I, I mean my go-to is always like, well, try some salmon. They're like, oh yeah, I've seen that on TV shows. I can eat salmon for breakfast. Oh, well, so, so you have a physician's assistant in your clinical practice that's working as a health coach. So just take us through kind of how that relationship works. Oh gosh, it um, sometimes works really well, and it, um, it's when I'm like on the ball because as the as the the boss, I have, I have to be like, oh, <laughs> lost my headphones here. <laughs> um, so as the boss, I have to like um, get her work to do because she, and then obviously she's like free to like do all kinds of programs. But it's really interesting. Like, oh man, I she's like relying on me. Like. I got to like get that patient ready for her to actually help them. So when things are functioning smoothly, so a lot of it's my fault as the doctor. I'm like, oh, I didn't like help that patient or, or the PA succeed in that. Um, but you, what happens is I see them for our first visit in my like 90 minute intake visit. And then I usually have lined them up with, with my health. She, and this, in this case, she's really more of the health coaching. So I line them up with my health coach PA who then, who then, helps deliver kind of like, if this is the plan that Dr. Rick and you put together, um, what questions do you have? How can I, well, what motivations? And going through that motivational process with, with them. And then we go back and forth. So I see their notes, I see what she's written and we go back and forth. And um, I have a patient right now who has been doing really well. I actually got her into a really great physical therapist um, and for some pain that she's been having and we've changed her nutrition and she has better, like my, my PA is mainly working with mindset with my patient right now. Cause her mindset was like so bad, but mm -hmm. her mindset is like turned around a lot, but it's been about three weeks that I haven't seen my patient. And I'm like, you know what? I think it's time. I need to actually, we need to have a visit because I've been seeing what's been going on with the other providers, but now I'm like, okay, we need to have a visit now because you've changed. Right. And so three weeks or four weeks, like things are different now. And we need to make sure that your plan is still the right plan for you going forward. And I think sometimes what happens is that patients are so used to a, a, the, the other model, that they're like, well, the doctor told me to do this. 
and then they're just gonna like they're gonna do that and so mm -hmm. then i'm like well i can change we can change that up or or sometimes they're like waiting and while i can be proactive as a physician and i try to reach out to my patients sometimes they're like well you never like you never like reached out to me and told me to do something different. i'm like why didn't you tell me like it was getting worse like what is going on <laughs> like like why don't my patients tell me that it's not working like that would be like that's a gift to me if you would tell me that like it's not working then i can we can modify that they're like oh yeah three weeks ago it stopped working so then i stopped doing that and then i did this instead and i'm like okay why please tell me next time so that we yeah. can figure that out but i think their patients are also fearful like oh the doctor told me to do that they're gonna like their ego or whatever because in the past they worked with doctors who've been pissed that like yeah. i can't believe you googled that and now you're changing so I think that they're fearful also of telling me that like it's not working for them. But if I can empower my patients and um, and give them the opportunity to like say like, hey, that's not working. It's like so much better to me, for me as a provider and, and it's so much more helpful. We love that yeah. word. Love that word empower. You know, I, I think you're I think so much of it, too, just comes from their handicap from past experience. Right. Um, sure. And, you know, look, I my mom is a prime example of someone who will go to the doctor and when the doctor tells her something she doesn't want to hear, she just doesn't do it. <laughs> what the hell good is that? You know, um, she just thinks the doc, you know, she's, she's got an underlying mistrust of doctors because of her past experience. Because of good, for a good reason. Yeah. yeah. Um, but at this, you know, I think some of this has got to come from just programming from, yes. yeah, you know, and you're probably one of the few doctors I've heard say, you know, I want to empower my patients to talk to me because you're right. I mean, I've, I've shown up at doctor appointments with articles that I found. Well, what a, back in my two year period where I was just sick, 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 and no one could fix me. I, I would come in and what do you think about this? They would literally roll their eyes at me, you know? So frustrating. Um, and I, but you know, finally found an alternative provider that helped. And now we're seeing this move into the more conventional medical space um, with you and, and doctors like you and organizations like SteadyMD and Verta Health is another great example, right? Um, so it's, the tide is changing, which I just asked. So one question I wanted to ask you is from the standpoint of telehealth, other than those who are just not tech savvy, are there, are there patients that you think really kind of need the more in-person model or are there conditions or circumstances that really would require like an in-person model? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. So there are some acute issues that we just can't deal with, right? So it's, I can't, it, even though we have cool technology and there's now stethoscopes that let you listen to heart and lungs, like if you're having like a really bad, like lung sy like syndrome, like it's really hard for me to get a good idea. Now I can use, past history, I can hear what you're telling me, but like sometimes I just have to listen to the lungs. Like I can't tell you how many times somebody has told me a story like, oh yeah, my lungs are doing this. And, and I'm like, ah, it's probably just a cold. I listened to their lungs and I'm like, well, you got pneumonia. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so that obviously those areas. Um, and then there are just, there are some, there are patients that are very complicated. And um, while I do have a lot of time, it's, it's sometimes hard to build the rapport enough to help take care of very complicated patients. Um, it's, it's, and so those patients, I do like to have, have them have an in-person doctor to take care of some of those things and I can do the others. Um, controlled substances, if you are someone that is dealing with chronic pain and you're on a controlled substance, like I can't, I can't help provide that across state lines, right? But I can help you get off of it. We can do some other things. And so you have like a provider in person that, and then me online. So there are certainly things that just are, or are too much for us. And then it really depends on the, the level of understanding of us doctors. Like I'll be honest, I'm just not good with like mold based issues. Like that's not my expertise. I'm not good at it. Lyme is really difficult to figure out. So some of these you're like, it's not necessarily telemedicine based. It's just like, I don't, I don't know how to do that. And so I yeah. think being upfront with people, but there's other things that like, nobody knows how to do. Like I have patients that are like, I've been to like a hundred doctors, right? And nobody knows what's going on. And they tell me what they have, like the diagnosis. I'm like, Oh my gosh. I like, I've never heard somebody actually having that, but like, tell me all about it. Like, tell me what it's like. So, so there are some patients that it's because I'm willing to like give the time and listen. There are some very complicated things that like, I really am the only, and like the best source, even though I like know nothing about what you've got. 
at least I'm willing to like listen and read your articles and we can kind of go through this process together. Um, and so, and then I learn from that also, but, but yeah, so I think, um, gosh, it's so hard to know. And that's where I think, um, being able to have some, at least, at least the barrier of alignment, at least like you're interested in the same things as me, we have that first barrier, but then there are other questions and that's where you do have to feel it out and try to figure out how it's going to work for you as an individual. It's such a, it's such a breath of fresh air to listen to you talk about the way you practice medicine. Like I, you know, I'm not the Lyme guy, so that's cool. Uh, I know my boundaries are, it's like, wow, I've never really met anybody with that diagnosis. Like, tell me more about it. Like, I would be so delighted if that was the medical, if the medical experience is more like that, like more of a collaborative, like co-creation rather than this sort of like master slave kind of teacher student, you know, subordinate kind of relationship. I think yeah. it, goes, again, it goes back to that empowerment piece a little bit. The empowerment, I think some, you know, this is a, this is a framework. I'm just, have you guys heard of Gretchen Rubin's four tendencies? Framework? Yeah. So, so this is another Obliger. thing that like, the, your obliger, right? Okay, so obliger or whatever, questioner. So I get a lot of questioner patients um, because they, you know, they haven't been heard by other providers. And so, and so I almost all of my patients, I'm like, we're going to do this quiz. Most of them I can figure out before doing, doing the quiz, but it helps them to understand what they are before. So I'm like, okay, if you're a questioner, I got to give you like 10 articles about like why you should stop eating like Monterey Jack versus like Swiss cheese or whatever it is. Like I have to like provide all the art then have to like understand them. And then I'm like, go home, think about it, meditate on like changing your dose from five to 10. Let's do where there's no rush. Just meditate on going up on a little bit on your dose and then we'll come and then let me know how you feel about that. And so, but other like the obligers, they're like, just, just tell me what to do and they'll do it. And I'm like, okay, I need you to, I need you to write back tomorrow that you, you bought, like, tell me that you went and bought a new bed, a new mattress because your mattress is terrible. And then I want you to tell me how it went last night. And then, and so then you have to like set those things up, but like, it's different for, for everyone on how that works. And like rebels are like the most fun because you have to like trick them into like doing what you want to do. <laughs> And so they're like, oh my gosh, you should fight against me. Like, I think and like trying to get them to like, okay, how do I like, not to like manipulate people, but like, that's what rebels need, right? They need to like be fighting against the man. And so then you're like, you should stop eating this because they want you to do it. Um, so yeah, but I think that really is a, I think, and to be honest, I think so more awesome. doctors would do what I did if they were in a model that allow them to do it. I think yeah. physicians are, are pigeonholed into their insurance model. Yeah. They're overworked, they're stressed out, and they can't even imagine doing something different. And so that is a product of their system. And so mm -hmm. as we can slowly change that, I think we can slowly change other things as well. Um, but that, and that's gonna be a really long process of, of modifying mm -hmm. that. But yeah. that's my question for you is because like for, for a long time, I've, I've, I've felt uh, sympathetic towards physicians because they are really locked into this thing that's really just hard to budge. But you did. Like, what is it about you that was like, mm, I'm just not going to do it that way? Like, and, and so, what was special about you and how were you so comfortable with it? Um, okay, well, this is probably similar to Laura. You just said that you had two years of being really sick and had all these problems, right? So I had my own problems. I was like, I went to Nepal and I traveled across the country and I came, I had like terrible IBS and I'm like, I can't. And you know, it was like personal experience, right? So that is the biggest driver. If you have been healthy your whole life or like you didn't understand that you were healthy, you know what I mean? Like if you perceived your health your whole life and the system was working for you, then you never realized that it actually wasn't working. So right. I think most people that are finding um, a new way have, have some kind of personal story they're a family member or themselves so that's a big part of it yeah. um because the western medical that system works for people it does work for a lot of people and so those people don't have motivation to to change it mm -hmm. um if you are comfortable with your salary and you don't have to think about anything else besides just seeing your patient for 15 minutes and being done then that works for you and so um for me, it wasn't working and I, and I was exploring other things, but I, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that, Aaron. I don't know where, how to make that change. And that's where I'm like, I'm not going to talk people into that. They have to experience that. Um, they have to see what I'm doing and then say, like, oh, maybe I want to do that. That looks really cool. 
um, I want to have a direct primary care clinic, even if they're totally Western medicine, they're not have nothing to do with paleo primal, or whatever, or even tell them like, if they just want to like change their model to like a monthly membership fee, like there are, that's a huge movement in the United States right yeah. now. Yep. Um, and so, and so that, that movement alone is, is massive and, and that can make a big difference in changing the way we're dealing with primary care. So I think a lot of these smaller pieces are all kind of coming together and they will have threads that, that go on. Okay. Yeah. Well, actually, can you explain that? So I, Laura, Laura's mentioning that she's, she's a steady MD patient and she, Laura, you pay a monthly fee. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I come from a land of universal healthcare. So all of this is foreign concept to me. I don't understand what it's like to pay for things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Although I do have to wait a long time for things. That's the, yeah. that's the <laughs> okay. So how does it work? Yeah. So the, the way it works is um, as if you were paying a gym membership, right? So you pay a, a monthly fee that covers anything you do with me as your provider or my PA or whatever set of benefits that is provided. You pay that fee. And I, and I like to look at it more like you have a yearly plan that you're paying in monthly installments because I think it's a better perspective for patients because it's like, like cause some months yeah. we don't do anything. And they're like, why did I pay for that month? I didn't even do anything. Well, last month I, we worked like three hours together. So, um, so I think looking at it more in this perspective, well, I have this like yearly plan and I'm paying it at a monthly rate. And, um, and so then they, all of the, all, everything they need in regards to that primary care or that, that issue is, is included in that cost. And that's going to vary um, depending on the organization or the provider. In Steady MD, it's anything that deals with me, my MAs, anything that you're, we're trying to set up. Now it doesn't cover what cost of labs, doesn't cover cost of other consultations, but, um, but it's really, a, and what it does um, to go like um, economics, a little bit is it changes the incentives, right? So the incentive, if you are doing a fee for service plan, um, fee for service means that every time a patient has to go in and see the doctor, they have to pay an amount. Um, that is an incentive for the doctor to keep bringing the patient into the clinic. And it's a disincentive to keep the patient out of the clinic. So right. they don't want to come in. The doctor is trying to get you to come in because the only time I get paid is if you come in, right? So. I am trying to have you, like, if you have a blood pressure check, I'm like, oh, come into the office and get your blood pressure done. And then I'll talk to you for five minutes. Um, well, it's going to help me pad my schedule because that business is going to be five minutes with the diabetes school and it's going to be 20, right? Or whatever it is. So, so you want them to come in because that, so it's just, a, it's just bad alignment, right? That's not like, that's not good care. Um, cause it's preventing you from wanting to go in. So then you have a universal, like if you had universal coverage, um, the incentive is different as well. Like, so that in that case, the doctor is trying to keep you out of the clinic and the patient is trying to use as much, right? That's the supposed thought. I actually haven't found that to be the case, to be honest. Like, so right now in the, what I call as a capitated or membership style is the patient pays a monthly fee. Their incentive is to use me as much as possible because they've already paid up front. My incentive is to do, to be, my incentive is not necessarily to keep you out, my incentive, because I'm a private person, is to keep you happy and to keep you healthy and to have high quality. Because if I stop providing high quality care for you, you're going to stop paying me. So my incentive changes in that I am now going to do the things that will keep you healthy and, and, provide, and keep you happy um, in that care because I want you to continue paying that monthly fee. So it changes the incentive structure um, in, 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 in a lot of different ways. Now, are they all positive? I mean, probably not all positive, but I think it works better than the previous kind of fee for service system. Um, and to be honest, I have not found, so I used to have this whole structure in my own, in my, in my private clinic, um, that like, if you paid a certain level, you had five visits a year. And if you paid a higher level and you had seven visits a year, and I like, it came to the point where it was like, nobody's using all the visits. Like nobody wants to go see their doctor. No matter if they've already paid for it. Nobody, like people are busy. They're not, I had nobody like overwhelm me with like visits. And I like, you know, I need you to come in more because you're so like, there's so many things that like, we need you to come in. They're like, really? I don't want to like overuse what I've paid for. I'm like, no, you trust me. Like use me more. Um, so I, I have not found the case that like people are overusing their, their physician. And, I, and, and this is actually like, is this applicable to like health coaching? I think probably, I think you could set up a system, right? Like I think the probably the traditional model in health coaching is, is, is probably plans, 
for a fee for service. Like every time you come and see me, it costs yeah. an X amount of money or you have a plan that like is for a whole year. So I think it's, I think there's a lot of parallels in how that structures and maybe people would use a coach more. I, I don't know, but you'd have to figure out some level of where that monthly fee makes mm -hmm. sense to charge for what you're able to provide long-term or your plan. And I think in general, we sell ourselves short. And to be honest, I think we underpriced steady MD, but that's a whole other discussion. Um, but, um, but yeah, I think we undersell what we're actually providing people to. So, um, that's really cool. You know, that yeah. Well, yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. And so like, I mean, you pay, you pay, so you have this annual membership fee you're paying monthly. And then is, is there a threshold as to how many times you can use the service or how many hours you get? So the, in SteadyMD, there's not, no. So there's, it's, so it's really, um, and in most cases, that's not overused. So there are yeah. some patients that are really heavy users and that's okay. They're, they're really busy. And there's some patients that don't use you at all. So you have to try to figure out that balance, but instead the way steady and is set up, there is not a restriction on, on that. Mm -hmm. Now it's not like, um, you know, I'm also constrained by my time and I don't have time to give paragraphs responses to every single question. Right. So if a patient is messaging me a lot, and then I would, it's easier for me to like, you know what, what we need to do, we need to schedule a 30 minute visit every two weeks and just ask me your questions because I can't keep responding to every little question every day, every thought that you have, like collect all of those up in a little bundle. And what I usually do is I'll, I'll sometimes I'll have a thread, like a, a channel open, like in a, we kind of have like a Slack clone that we use mm -hmm. a channel that's like questions. And then they just like type their questions in there. And then in our visit, we like address oh, their cool. questions in that way. Oh, that's cool. They can brain dump their questions in real time. And then you can just like, yeah, totally. That's cool. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, <clears throat> we're not heavy users cause we're not ill people, at least my family, you know, yeah. but, but when I needed it, I had access to it, you know? Um, and there's probably some things now that, um, um, I, you know, other things that I kind of want to dial in. I had Brad use my blood glucose monitor and has found a few things that, you know, he wants to address with his doctor. So now we yeah. can have, we can have actual conversations about staying well. So you view the idea of talking with the doctor differently. It's not right. just because you have a sore throat and a fever or because something hurts. It's, mm -hmm. Hey, I had this idea or, Hey, this is what I'm trying to do. And, you know, both my doctor and his doctor, the, the conversation was all about how to, how to, how to get there. Yeah. You know what you're trying to do. Oh all yeah. That. I mean, I have, I have patients that, I mean, pay, so some of my patients are researching way more than I am on specific yeah. topics. I have this, like, I have this like 65 year old guy who's <laughs> the healthiest dude on the planet. Like he's like, he every day he wakes up and does like an hour of like stretching meditation and then he goes for a walk with his wife and then he's like i mean he's like a total optimizer and then he but he loves he comes into my office and we just like sit back for like an hour and he just like asks me questions and things he's been reading and i'm like this is the best thing ever this guy's paying me <laughs> for like an education i love it um yeah. it's so fun to be able to work but also i think for those patients it is also really helpful to be able to have somebody that has some of that background and knowledge to to be able to bounce ideas off of and don't feel like you're doing this in isolation oh man that's so great it's so novel this collaborative yeah. approach and you know i'm going to give you a sad 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 story a sad tale of universal healthcare. quick anecdote i have paid into it for my whole life because it's not free. Sorry. It's right. not free. <laughs> Very expensive actually when you do the math on it tax wise anyway, but I never use it because like Laura, I'm not an unwell person. So what I would really like, I'd really like a pay per use system because I don't use it. So I could be saving a shit ton of money. Sorry. But anyway, so the one time I did need to use it, this is two years ago. I, I hurt myself. I had an accident. I was having some rib pain. I couldn't really breathe. So I went to the urgent care to get an x-ray because I wanted to know if they were broken or sprained. If they're sprained, I'm going to go to my chiropractor, not sprained, sorry, dislocated. I'm going to go to my chiropractor, get them put back in, go on with my life. If they're broken, obviously I wouldn't do that. So I went to the urgent care to get this checked out. The first time I've used, the first time I've used my universal health care in, I don't know how many decades, I've just literally never used it. And I got x-ray shamed. I got x-ray shamed. The doctor came in with my x-ray. She's like, well, your ribs are broken. I'm like, oh, she's like, I'm not sure what you want me to do about it. Uh, we can't put a cast on you. I, I don't really know why you came here. I'm like, yo, what? <laughs> dude, I, like, I get it. I get it. People are overburdening this system, but I'm not one of them. 
I'm not one of, this is the first time I've used it. And I, I, did, I really did get a sense for this doctor that, that, wow. that the system is being overused. And that's sort of the flip side of, the, that's the, because you described the, in the universal healthcare system, the patient is like taking advantage and the doctor's like, please leave me alone. Like I'm getting overburdened. So I just absolutely love this. This mm -hmm. paper use system is such a cool idea. The collaborative nature of it is so just exciting. Um, man, I'm just really pumped about what you're doing. I'm sorry, I'm just like gushing. I'm just like, so thank good. you. It is. I think I, I gush about. I think it's awesome. I think yeah. it's really <laughs> effective. I love my job. I'm way happier. Um, it's harder in a lot of ways, but it's easier in a lot of ways. So yeah, I mean, yeah. I think it really is fantastic. Yeah. So for like all you health coaches listening, uh, I, I definitely see a parallel to building a very similar model um, from a health coaching perspective. You know, if there's ever an argument for kind of like a membership or a subscription for, because this, this comes up with clients who, um, you know, they're ready, you're ready to let them go. They're ready to be on their own, but they're a little like afraid. You know, they finally found some success and they're afraid to kind of, this is where having a, just an ongoing kind of monthly where they, uh, where you can continue to provide value on a monthly basis. Maybe it's through, um, you know, a newsletter that's just for people that subscribe for you, not, you know, not stuff they're going to find on like a, your public channel or whatever, or maybe it's an opportunity to just check in every so often. Um, I mean, I, I think that makes a ton of sense and it allows your clients that just graduated and are successful that when things change, something in their life changed, that something happened and they just kind of need that support. They've got the, um, the ability to come back to you. I, I definitely think there's a tremendous model there and, and sort of this change, this adoption of telecare that we saw forced on us with COVID MD at high, high numbers is something we need to take advantage of as health coaches, um, and kind of jump on that. Um, and this appetite for wellness and prevention, uh, I think is something that we need to take advantage of too. So, I mean, this has been, I just think a great eye opener for any health coach listening and, but also just any health consumer listening that there is another way, another, another model. And I think health coaches can leverage services like steady MD, yes. you know? Yeah. To yeah, you, help you get up. You get a client that's got some symptomatic thing that feels out of scope and you're like, you know, I'm going to refer you to this, this website, SteadyMD. Like, I, I wish we had this in Canada because I would be referring people all over the place to it. Mm -hmm. Coming you know. soon, maybe. We're trying to figure okay. it out. But. Cool. Keeping fingers crossed. So thank you for your candor and your enthusiasm and your passion for this and your willingness to share. I just think it's been great. So I know there are some folks that are probably going to want to check you out and kind of who you are and what you do as an ancestrally aligned physician, because we do have folks at Primal Health Coach that are looking for you. Yeah. Um, you know, and when there's situations that can be done across state lines, so they, they may want to find you specifically. So if you would share that and then also where people can find out more about SteadyMD as well. Absolutely. So probably the easiest way is through my Instagram, which is, which is at Rick Hen MD. Um, and that will take you to links to my local clinic and to my SteadyMD clinic, the SteadyMD, like if you might, my individual page, it's SteadyMD slash Dr. Rick. Um, takes you to my SteadyMD page to, to directly sign up with me. Um, I'm taking a few patients right now, not a ton, um, but a few patients um, to fill out um, my panel. But there's a lot of other good providers if, if I'm not available as well. Um, and yeah, that's the best way to get in contact with me. I have really enjoyed chatting with both of you. I think what you're doing is great work and your health coaches are doing awesome stuff. So keep it up. I know it can be discouraging at some point, but keep pushing through it. Um, and, and I'm excited to reach out to me if, you, if they have any questions, they can also just reach out to me at rick at um, steadymd.com if they have um, non kind of patient questions or something like that. Um, I'd be happy to address those as well. Ooh, cool. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Rick. Thank you. This podcast was brought to you by Primal Health Coach Institute. To learn more about how to become a successful health coach, get in touch with us by visiting primalhealthcoach.com forward slash call. Or if you're already a successful health coach, practitioner, influencer, or thought leader with a thriving business and an interesting story, we'd love to hear from you. Connect with us at hello at primalhealthcoach.com and let us know why we need to interview you for Health Coach Radio. Thanks for listening.
Well, if you've been listening at Health Coach Radio, you'll know that we're all about raising the voices of practicing health, fitness, and nutrition coaches, but most importantly, helping to further legitimize this exploding industry. Erin and I have disclosed often that we're on the faculty of the Primal Health Coach Institute, founded by none other than the health and wellness legend, Mark Sisson. And we've interviewed dozens of guests from just about every different health coaching program you can think of, and who practice in just about any conceivable way you can think of. But our allegiance is to the health coaching industry in its totality, first and foremost. It's our desire to continuously and unapologetically lift and promote this industry that nudged us to create this podcast for you in the first place. It's this same yearning that encouraged us to take the educational offering at our health coaching school to the next level. We are so proud to offer the Primal Health Coach Level 2 Certification Course, which when combined with our primary course, the Primal Health Coach Certification Course, not only satisfies the educational requirements to sit for the board exam, but is specifically designed to teach advanced coaching mastery. You will work closely with a small class of peers through this 12-week, very intensive, live online classroom experience to learn how to execute a coaching relationship that is truly transformational. You'll learn and practice how to ask powerful questions, what it means to hold space for your clients, but most importantly, how to actually do it. You'll learn about the craft of motivational interviewing and the nuances of habit change, goal setting, and accountability, and how to nurture your client's own inner knowing, their intuition, and their own self-efficacy so that they will graduate from your care a truly transformed person. You want a big, successful, powerful coaching practice. And maybe you're devouring our episodes looking for the silver bullet that's going to launch your business into the upper echelons. We've said it a million times and we'll say it again. Your coaching skills are what will make or break you and set you apart for success in this field. So if you're looking to level up your coaching skills, and maybe dial up your credential and become a board-eligible health coach, look no further. You can learn more about PHCI's Level 2 program at primalhealthcoach.com forward slash level 2. But if you would value talking to a real person about your path to being a masterful coach and perhaps a board-certified coach, book some time with me personally. You can access my calendar at primalhealthcoach.com forward slash call. Or just call me. You can reach me at 844-307-7662. Thank you for listening to Health Coach Radio, and I hope I get to talk to you soon.